Holland, the Netherlands. What lies behind this endless line of toy-like houses and oceans of tulips? The legalization of marijuana coupled with same-sex marriage. This country boasts stuck not only stereotypes, but also a lot of things that tourists never learn about. That's what we're going to find out. And as usual, the longer you watch, the more interesting it becomes because the most surprising things always show up at the end of the video. But before we begin, make sure you've subscribed to the channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated with future content. Let's start with the main stereotype according to which the Netherlands and Holland are the same things. In fact, this is not entirely true. The Netherlands is the state's official name, which includes 12 provinces, the most developed of which since the late Middle Ages are North and South Holland. The residents of these provinces traveled around the world most often. This is the place where most of the export goods were and are still being produced. That is why the name Holland is on everyone's lips. By the way, the fact that the Netherlands is called Holland is very irritating to the Dutch themselves. The Dutch government believes that it harms the image of the country. According to officials, the word Holland has become a kind of anti-brand associated with drugs and prostitution. Frankly speaking, this reputation has a reason. The Netherlands has officially allowed prostitution. It has been legal since 2000, bringing an average of about $100 million a year into the country's economy as taxes. The government strictly controls all brothels. Another stereotype is associated with tulips. The Netherlands has been associated with these flowers for centuries. Many believe that they originated there. In fact, their homeland is Turkey. Tulips only came to Europe from the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century. In 1562, the first large batch of Turkish tulips were brought to the city of Antwerp. Gardeners from Europe loved the flower and noticed a similarity between its shape and the traditional Turkish headdress. They gave it a name, Tupapan, from Tulbend, the Turkish turban. Today, the Netherlands is considered the most important producer and exporter of tulips in the world. And not just tulips, 75% of all flower bulbs in the world are of Dutch origin. However, globalization changed the flower's homeland, just like everything else in our lives. Flower growers now mainly grow flowers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Holland is also relocating production to these countries. However, it is still the world leader in the flower trade. But at the same time, more and more goods are imported. The exception is bulbous flowers. They are grown in large quantities as before. In good years, small farms that have been involved in this business for generations sell up to 10 billion tulip bulbs, representing 70% of all tulip production in the world. Flowers are sold at the Flora Holland Flower Exchange, a floral exchange that has been trading flowers for more than a century. It includes 5,000 flower growing companies. The bidding is done with an auction clock, which instead of time, shows the time of a particular lot. The bidding duration is less than a minute. As soon as the buyer sees an acceptable price on the clock, he presses the button, stopping the bidding. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. The underwater part consists of gigantic hangars with huge refrigerators, special flights, and electric cars that scurry around this ocean of colors. But let's move from the flower sheds to the city streets. What would the average person do when seeing the rain outside the window? Take an umbrella before going out. As for the Dutch, they don't do that, preferring raincoats. After all, you can't ride a bicycle with an umbrella. This is the favorite mode of transport of the Dutch. There are more bicycles here than inhabitants, 18 million versus 17 million. During World War II, the German army took many bicycles from the Netherlands. For this, the Dutch still make fun of German tourists, saying, give us back our bicycles. In spite of the bicycle craze, the Netherlands holds the record as the country with the lowest rate of bicycle accidents. Cycling while drunk is strictly punishable by law, as is cycling without flashlights in the dark. Bicycles are also popular because, apart from the rain, nature does not interfere with cycling. There's almost no severe frost here, so you can ride year-round. And if the cold winter comes when all the rivers freeze over, they organize the famous skating marathon in 11 cities over 200 kilometers. Skating is also one of their oldest traditions. Whatever we may think of the Netherlands as super advanced and developed, we can safely call it a country of villages. Despite the highest population density in Europe, it is easier to meet a countryside resident than an urban dweller. How else could it be if there are about 60 cities in this country, of which only four are large? Instead, there are as many as 479 villages. This is another country's achievement. The Netherlands is among the leaders in exporting agricultural products. Only China, the US, and Germany are ahead of the Netherlands. 
This country is also the world leader in the export of seeds, live trees, and plants in principle. For example, the country sells seeds worth a couple of billion dollars a year, while it does not supply the market with seeds of genetically modified products. All this despite the fact that the Netherlands does not boast a huge area. The country is half the size of the state of South Carolina. However, such agricultural abundance wasn't constant. The production has increased thanks to the country's new agricultural policy greatly adopted two decades ago, produced twice as much for half the resources available. Since 2000, farmers have reduced water use for irrigation by 90%. They have almost completely abandoned the use of pesticides in greenhouses. And since 2009, Dutch poultry and livestock farms have reduced the use of antibiotics by 60%. From the height of a quadcopter, you can see unusual structures resembling giant mirrors, which sparkle in the sun during the day and emit a strange inner glow at night. This is what the Dutch greenhouse complexes look like. Some are up to 173 acres in size. Thanks to them, the country, which is not so far from the Arctic Circle, has become a world leader in the supply of tomatoes. The Netherlands is also considered the best supplier of potatoes and onions and the second largest producer of vegetables in the world. The country owes this agricultural achievement to Wageningen University, the best agro-industrial research institute in the world. This university is a key element of the food valley in which technological agricultural startups and experimental farms are developing. In doing so, the future of Dutch agriculture is shaped not in the negotiating rooms of large corporations and agro-giants, but on thousands of family farms. It is also the lowermost country in Europe. 26% of its territory is below sea level. Approximately 60% of the population lives as much as 16 feet below sea level. The country's lowest point, the Zwadplas polder, is 23 feet. Naturally, most of the territory is protected by dikes. For example, the country's main airport, Schiphol, serves millions of passengers a year. What about people? The people in the Netherlands are also peculiar. To start with, the inhabitants of this country are considered the tallest people in Europe. The average height of an adult Dutch man is 6 feet 6 inches, and women are under 5 feet 7 inches. Scientists attribute this peculiarity to genetic predisposition and the country's high level of nutrition and health care. According to the researchers, consuming large quantities of dairy products plays an important role in this. The Netherlands constantly occupies the highest position in the rankings of the happiest countries in the world. Young residents are especially satisfied with their country. According to a Dutch National Statistics Office study, 94% of adolescents between the ages of 12 and 18 say they are pleased with their living conditions. Sex education does not impede their happiness, we will discuss next, nor even the legalization of marijuana, which every adult can buy in a coffee shop near his home. However, a minor can face very serious penalties for selling soft drugs. A person who buys a pot from a coffee shop can only use 5 grams per person. It is also possible to grow up to 5 cannabis plants at home for personal consumption. The level of marijuana use in the Netherlands is one of the lowest in Europe, as is the mortality rate due to drug use, 8 cases per million inhabitants. For example, in the UK, this figure is equal to 50. The Dutch have an interesting attitude toward religion. Most of them are atheists. That's 40%, 30% are Catholics, and 20%, including the royal family, are Protestants. Most Protestants live in the north. This region is even appropriately named the Bible Belt. The inhabitants of this region are known for their religious conservatism. They are very serious and closed. A strict order governs all their life, and they do not like newcomers. Tourists visiting the Netherlands are strongly advised not to visit these areas. By the way, a very interesting tradition is associated with excessive religiosity. In the Netherlands, they do not cover the windows. It is believed that it emerged due to citizens' adherence to the Protestant religion. Thus, the devout Dutch show that they have nothing to the hide their way of life conforms to Christian moral principles. Perhaps it is this principle of openness that guides the Dutch when they have communal gatherings and saunas, and the Dutch traditionally bask in the nude. By and large, work is treated here with no great zeal. More than half of the working age population has a part-time job. This is much more than in any other wealthy country in the world. At the same time, the Dutch are one of the most traveled nations in the world. At the age of 20 to 40, they often work and live for several years in other countries. So, it is not surprising that Dutch people have a unique attitude toward corporate culture. People from other countries who move to live and work in the Netherlands often complain about the aloofness of their Dutch colleagues. Their arguments are very simple. Eight hours a day is enough. No need to take their colleagues home too. 
Another version is that the Dutch keep their co-workers away from their families because of gossip and discussion of their private lives. Apparently, there's a lot to gossip about, considering that same-sex marriages have been legalized in the country since 2001, and since 2009, homosexual couples can adopt children. At this point, we should take a look at how they deal with child welfare under such laws. Here, in fact, as in many European countries, all elementary school pupils are supposed to receive sex education. This education starts in kindergarten at the age of four. Eight-year-olds learn about gender stereotypes and 11-year-olds discuss sexual orientation and contraception. You can comment on whether this is good or bad, but in the meantime, let's note another interesting thing. It is pretty normal here for dads to take time off from work to be with their children. Dutch employers have long been accustomed to Father's Day and often use it as an advantage during interviews or contract negotiations. Moms here also have their own traditions. From generation to generation, they pass down the following item. What do you think it is? No, you're wrong. This is the birthing chair. More than 30% of women prefer to give birth at home, and there is no ambulance on duty near the house. Resuscitation is expensive, even if the birth takes place in a hospital. Postpartum monitoring is done at home, and the woman is usually discharged a few hours after giving birth. A Kramsorg nurse will be waiting there to teach the new mom how to handle the baby, feeding, bathing, changing diapers, etc., to help with the child when mom is resting, and to do household chores, cleaning the toilet and the bathroom, cleaning the room where mom and baby are, cleaning the kitchen, washing and ironing, changing the bedclothes and all this for eight days, a few hours a day. It's all covered by insurance. The state pension is about $1,000 there. Frankly, much more comprises corporate pensions and your own savings. However, this does not mean that when you see cheerful Dutch retirees on cruises and other excesses, they are workaholics who have been saving for a lifetime. After all, there is also the so-called old money. A large percentage of all old European travelers are simply descendants of people who were far from poor. Some have real estate on a lease, some have an inheritance, a small business, a restaurant, or simply a bank deposit from previous generations. This is not surprising because the Netherlands is the country that gave rise to financial inventions in Europe and the world, and it's hard to imagine today's reality without these innovations. Let's see whether an evil or a good financial genius invented these things. In 1602, the Amsterdam Stock Exchange appeared, which is considered to be the oldest existing exchange. Holland has a strong legacy with geographical names around the world. For example, New York was founded as a Dutch colony and was originally called New Amsterdam. Also, the Dutch were the first Europeans to set foot on the land of Australia and New Zealand. Australia was then called New Holland. At the same time, New Zealand was named after the province of Zeeland in the Netherlands. As many as three Caribbean islands, Bonaire, St. Eustatius, and Saba are still part of the Netherlands. The inhabitants of these islands are citizens of this country and have the right to participate in elections in the European Union. Actually, the historical time when Holland was spinning the whole world, so to speak, on the ship's mast is quite interesting and informative. For example, the following historical episode is worth mentioning. Many of you have heard the phrase East India Company, but only some know that several of them were British, Danish, Portuguese, French, Austrian, and Swedish. So, when the Netherlands emerged as Europe's leading maritime and colonial power, it was the Dutch East India Company that was one of the largest in the world. It was a state within a state. Besides the monopoly in foreign trade, it also had the rights to conclude international trade agreements, navigation, duty-free transport of goods to the metropolis, establishing trading posts, fortified coastal fortresses, court proceedings, and maintenance of the armed forces and the military fleet. For that time, it was the greatest transnational corporation, just like modern digital giants, which are binding every inhabitant of the planet with their networks. All they have to do is establish floating digital cities, which will drift in neutral waters, and then it will be not states within states, but states beyond states. Similar projects have been repeatedly announced in case you haven't seen it. In the West, scholarly interest in the history of these East India companies has increased dramatically. The former mega corporations, which were often much stronger and more influential than single states, even though they formally acted in the country's interest in which they were created. A board of 17 directors governed the Dutch East India Company and in 1602 became the world's first stock company because it was the first to offer its founders shared responsibility for the fate of sailing ships and, of course, to share in the profits from new lands, treasures, and spices, which were prized in Europe like gold. In fact, only one ship in three returned home, while the rest became victims of force majeure, pirates, storms, and so on. 
but a successful voyage brought enormous profits. Thus, the percentage of a shareholder's possible profit directly depended only on the amount of this contribution, the measure of which became the world's first shares. Until 1644, dividends were paid in kind, with goods brought in, mostly spices, and later only in money. By 1669, the company was the richest private firm in history, including more than 150 commercial ships, 40 warships, 50,000 employees, of whom 25,000 were in Asia and 3,000 in the Netherlands, and a private army of 10,000 soldiers. The company was involved in the political disputes of the time. Thus, in 1641, without the help of the Dutch state, it independently knocked out of present Indonesia its rivals, the Portuguese. For this purpose, the company financed the creation of armed detachments from the local population. Moreover, in a number of colonial territories, the company had the right to mint. Of course, Holland's history is not limited to the East India Company. There's everything, betrayal by monarchs, civil wars, capital flight, rising domestic taxes, and, therefore, rising prices. But that's the subject of a separate video. Another example is the now fashionable and quite workable 300 years ago external public debt. The Dutch were the first to realize that they could trade their debt and trade it at a profit. Or here's another scheme. Imagine a bank that takes deposits, gives bonds to borrowers, and pays interest of 6% a year. Every year, the borrowers gather and receive interest for life. If one of them dies, his share is divided among the survivors. The loan is considered repaid when the last borrower dies. The amount of the loan is not repaid. Under such a scheme, it is enough to have a 6% reserve on the entire debt payment every year, and the rest of the money can be used for any purpose. And here's another idea. To invest money in the national debt bonds of England at 8% per annum, and under this issue, the national debt bonds of Holland at 4% per annum, after all the manipulations, there is 4% of the profit. This manipulation was invented by people who, as of 1785, were about 25,000 people living in Holland. Of these, about 5,000 worked in the banking and investment business. Of these 5,000, about 500 were the largest banking power brokers not only in Holland, but in the world. These 25,000 people in Holland were divided into two groups, the Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews. By the late 18th century, the Ashkenazi Jews had more business with France and Germany and the Sephardic with England and the United States. However, there were examples to the contrary. For instance, the same Meyer Amschel Rothschild, who, as a German Jew, was a manager at Wilhelm of Hesse Castle and was engaged in selling soldiers to the British during the French Revolution and bonuses for those killed. Around 1785, the Bank of Amsterdam abandoned the principle of 100% reserve, which for two centuries had made it the most reliable bank in the world and moved first to 25% and then to 10% reserve. At the same time, Dutch investments in foreign banks and industries increase manifold. Capital begins to flee from Holland. Meanwhile, 90% of Holland's income was concentrated in the hands of 8% of the people. The whole country worked to fill their pockets and make them even richer. The people were getting poorer. Reminds me of something, doesn't it? The 8% didn't think much of Holland. They were doing fine in London, New York, and Paris. They saw Holland as a place where a bunch of beggars paid their foreign debt with taxes. To summarize, Holland is a unique example of a country that has been ruined by its own internal debt and the totally predatory, usurious banking nature of its economy. Historians put it this way, it is not the fact that Holland has fallen from the ranks of the great powers of Europe that is surprising, but that it has survived so long. But let's go back to the present. The Netherlands as a country of contrast has also managed to leave a footprint in the development of modern technology. The Dutch city of Eindhoven was named the world's leading center of scientific discoveries in 2011. The Netherlands is also a leader in the development of high-tech equipment and micro and nano technology. Approximately 94% of the Dutch population uses the internet, which is the highest rate in the world. It was Dutch companies that invented CDs and DVDs, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The Netherlands has a surprising way of intertwining quite contradictory phenomena. As a country of free morals with super advanced technology and legalized prostitution and soft drugs, the Netherlands remains in some ways a very traditional and even puritanical country. That's all for now. Maybe the end of the world should start with this country. What do you think? Or on the contrary, can we learn something from them? Write in the comments what facts about the Netherlands surprised you the most. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon and give this video a big thumbs up.